we just started. This is the fourth study in the book of Acts, so we're not very far along. But we are slowly getting through this chapter, and there is, I've, I've kind of determined I don't want to go too quickly, nor do I want to go too slow either, uh, but there are things here that we need to grasp onto, and and I think they will help us as we go the rest of the way through the letter, and some of those things we will see tonight. What we're talking about is uh, the foundation for the apostles. This is chapter one's kind of a preparation to get them ready to kick off um, basically the church once the Spirit of God comes whenever we get into chapter two on the day of Pentecost. So this is kind of just giving them a foundation to get them started, to, that foundation for them to be able to do what they need to do with what's coming up. So that's what we've been looking at. Let me get you to the introduction, and we'll work our way down across the paper tonight. It says, tonight we return again to Acts chapter 1, and we're looking at how the apostles were prepared by the Lord for what they were about to engage in, and that was to carry the gospel out into the world the lessons here are basic and fundamental, but these fundamental lessons are very important for us to be reminded of. So these are basic, fundamental truths. There is one thing here that we're going to talk about tonight that is vitally important. It is a theological point that is really, really important, important and I will point this out in something that was said by the apostles and something that was not said by Jesus whenever they had a question. But the first thing that we're looking at tonight is uh, uh, kind of a misunderstanding that they had, and it's looking for the kingdom. Watch verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. Here's what it says. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, let me just say this. Uh, a lot of people have faulted the apostles for that question right there, looking uh, it, for the time. They're, they're, they're asking, what's the timing of the kingdom is what they're asking. And, and Jesus will lightly rebuke them as he goes on here as, as we go into the next verse. And we'll get to that in a moment. But these you got to understand because of the Old Testament prophecies they're looking for the kingdom. And when after Jesus died and was buried and rose again, and and they for 40 days, he made himself known to them and appeared to them multiple times. They began to understand this is the king. This is the king that the Old Testament has talked about. And so they're looking for that kingdom. And so they're thinking they're, they're thinking that he's going to set up the kingdom. What they don't understand yet, when, when we are here in chapter 1, they do not understand that there is going to be the church age, which uh, we're about to launch into, so to speak. They don't understand that between the cross and the, and, and the empty tomb and, and between the empty tomb and the, the millennial kingdom, that there is, a, there is a period of time in there that they were unable to see, which is the age in which we live in right now. They, they did not see that. They didn't. The Old Testament prophets could not see that. But that's what they're looking for. So what's your paper again? This is such an important question asked by the apostles. Okay, and I'll get into this a little bit more, but I'll, I'll touch on it briefly here. The fact that Jesus did not correct their thinking is really important. Okay, watch this. They were looking for an earthly kingdom in which they would rule with him and Israel would be restored to global prominence. Okay, and, and just listen to what I'm going to tell you. And Jesus did not correct their thinking, which means that kingdom is coming. And I point that out because there are people that will tell you that there is not going to be an earthly thousand year reign of Christ. And, and that it, we're told that there will be in Revelation chapter 20, but people that say that there is no earthly kingdom, they will tell you that you can't take the thousand years literal. And so they say it's not, you can't see that that's not a literal kingdom on the earth. Well, right here, 
they say, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're looking for that earthly kingdom. They're looking for a kingdom whenever Israel will, will be restored to global prominence. A lot of people that say that there is no earthly kingdom also say that the church has replaced Israel. When they say here, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel, and Jesus never corrects that, that tells you that they were right about their theology. They were dead on with their theology. Let me go on with this. Watch this. We will see this confirmed in Acts 3 when we read Peter's sermon. I just took a chunk out of it, but here's what they're looking for. Watch this in Peter's sermon in Acts 3, 18 through 21. He says, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted. He's speaking to an unsaved crowd. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now watch this. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's a reference to that kingdom. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. So uh, Peter is referencing the, the, the earthly kingdom here. That's exactly what these guys are looking for right here. They're looking for the kingdom. They're looking for... Israel to be restored to, to global prominence. Now, let me go on to your paper. Watch this. Let us notice a few verses in the Old Testament that the apostles would have been familiar with. And there are many of them, but I'm just going to pull a few of them out to show you where they're coming from. Isaiah chapter 1, 25 and 26 says this, And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at first, and thy counselors, as at the beginning, afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. So there again, that's what they're looking for. They, they knew these verses. They knew them very well. Watch the next one, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Very familiar text. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. you got to understand, they, these verses are in their minds, and they have just watched the greatest miracle ever to take place. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day. And then Jesus takes them into the Old Testament and shows them how he's the fulfillment of prophecy. So now these guys are just chomping at the bit for the kingdom. And because now they're realizing, you know what? These are not just words. We're starting to see things fulfilled here. Watch Isaiah 35, 4 through 10. They would have known this. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out in streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, through, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Is it any wonder they're looking for that? That's what they're looking for. They know the verses very well. They know that. They know what that kingdom is going to be like very well. They know that. 
And so they're looking for that kingdom. Let me give you one more. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. This is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now listen, just say, let me give you something to think about. They're under the Roman Empire. They are, they are under the Roman Empire. And so they're reading Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Is it any wonder they were looking for the kingdom? That's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. So they asked the question. But watch verses 7 and 8. Watch how Jesus responds. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. We'll come back to that. That's interesting. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. See, what they did not understand was that there was there had to be a church, which is you and I, but, but we are also the bride of Christ. They didn't understand that. They couldn't see it because that was not foretold in the Old Testament. And so here in these verses, Jesus gently rebukes their idea. Instead of looking at the timing, they needed to get busy doing what he had called them to do. Basically, what's your paper? It's so important to notice that Jesus did not correct their thinking, their, uh, should say, thinking concerning the kingdom. This means their theology was correct. There will be a future earthly kingdom in which God will fulfill his promises to Israel. Jesus did not rebuke them, or did rebuke them for desiring to know the times. The timing was not for them to know, for it was God's timing. The concern of the apostles was to be witnessing and carrying the gospel into the world. There's an Old Testament verse that connects here. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, and one of them is the timing. The timing. When is Christ going to return and set up the kingdom? We could say, when is the rapture going to occur? We don't know. Those things are with the Lord. Those are the secret things of our God. It goes on. The verse goes on to say, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Back to verse 7 again. Let me read it for you. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Two different words, times and seasons. What's your paper? I want you to notice two words here, the word times and the word seasons. These have different meanings. Times refers to duration of times. In other words, how long something lasts. And seasons refers to both the length of times and the kind of times. In other words, either tough times or easy times. So you, you have one word that, that refers to the duration of something that comes. The other word, this, the word seasons, is referring basically to what kind of time is that? Okay, now watch this. This will be good for us. The verse also tells us that both are controlled by the power of God. Watch verse 7 again. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So you see who controls it. Now let me pull it together. Watch this. That means that how long something lasts is determined by God. And it also means that God determines what kind of times we will experience. They can be easy times or they can be trying times. Whatever it is that we are experiencing, we can be sure that God has determined a time when it will end because it's in his control. It is not for you to know the times, the length of time. It's not for you to know that or the seasons. 
or whether it's not for you to, to it's not for us to determine is it going to be a time of ease or is it going to be a time of difficulty that's not for me to determine that's all in god's power so in in life let, let me just hold up right there for a second in life we go through different seasons do we not we go through sometimes the seasons are very pleasant and things go well and and there's no problems but that's only for a while there i've said it before and i'll say it again you are in one of three groups you are either coming out of a problem or you're dealing with a problem or you're about to encounter a problem that's life that's the world in which we live in we live under a fallen world and so that's just part of the way this world functions but even at that it's all under god's control and so when those difficult seasons come god determines when they will end it's not for me to determine. It's not for you to determine. It, it, let me say this. It is not for me to complain, and it's not for you to complain. You know what our responsibility is? Listen to this. It is to view it with a biblical perspective. In other words, when those difficult times come, it is for me to view it and say this, God, how can I glorify you in the midst of this? And for the duration, Lord, how can I glorify you? Because that's why I am here. It is for me to trust him that know that, that he's brought it and this too shall pass. There will be a, there will be an end. You say, well, what if it's, what if it's a terminal illness? What if it's something that takes my life? Well, it'll end, won't it? There will be a door, there will be a time when it will end, and if it ends in death, then then uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So He determines the length of it. He determines what it will be like. That's how much control He has over our lives. Back to your paper, right at the in that paragraph there again at the bottom, it says He uses both of these in our lives. Whatever season we are going through, we can rest assured it's in God's control and he's using it for his purpose in our lives. One of the verses that fits best with that, Malachi 3.3, 3, says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. L let me bring that into our lives. We could say this, he sits as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify his church. And he will purge his church like gold and silver. And he will sometimes, because he sits as a refiner, he will control the temperature of the trial that we are in. And he knows what you can take, and he knows what I can take. And so he keeps his hand on the thermostat, just like a silversmith does. And you know the story about the silversmith. The silversmith knows when the silver is purified because he can see his reflection in the silver. That's God's desire for us, that we become purified so that whenever he looks at us, he sees his son. That's what we are here for, to glorify him. Let me show you 1 Peter 6 and chapter 1, 6 and 7. It says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. We looked at that. that that's these people that are going through suffering. But here Peter talks about, watch this, the trial. That the trial of your faith, that's what it was. That's what that persecution was. It was a testing of the faith. That's what sometimes those, the, the difficult seasons, they are the trying of our faith. How are we going to do? Let, let me read the rest of this. The trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We are to trust our Lord in the midst of, of the trials. I, I, I believe without a doubt uh, the 
the the apostles would have got that. They would have known that they would have known those words. And how appropriate for what they were about to encounter. Watch seven and eight again. Let me read down through them. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. By the way, I, I didn't put this on your paper, but Jerusalem's where it's going to start. Then it's going to go to Judea, then it's going to go out into Samaria, then it's going to go to the other, uh, to, to the utmost part of the earth, the ends of the globe. But, but watch this, watch the top of page four. When I read these verses again, I see that the apostles wanted to discuss the timing of the kingdom, but Jesus was concerned more about reaching the lost with the gospel. The kingdom would one day be established, but there was a responsibility given to the apostles, and that was to carry the message into the world. They would be empowered by the Holy Spirit for this very purpose. Watch verse 8 again. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So they were given the Holy Spirit so that they could testify of Christ. Watch the application. We need to take a step back here and look at our own lives. This command is not just for the church as a corporate body, but it's a personal command for each one of us. It's our responsibility to see that we do all we can to get the message of the gospel out into the world. Many church members sit back and say, well, that's the church's responsibility as a whole to get the gospel out. They do not realize that it's a, it is a personal responsibility. Now, someone might say, I can't go to the ends of the world with the gospel, but you can personally give to a missionary that can, or you can give to a radio program that gets the word out. There's ways that you do it. There's ways that you do it. It is each of our responsibilities. We don't, listen, we don't just throw, we don't just put money in the offering plate and then sit back and say, well, whatever I can't do, the church will do. Listen, there's, we got to do all we can. We got to do all we can. Let me go on. As Jesus was about to leave this earth, he explained to his apostles that they were to be his witnesses. He was not just speaking to these men in our text, but he was also speaking to you and me. We are his witnesses. We are to be eager to testify of what he has done for all sinners. We too are empowered as they were. The very same spirit that was given to them is given to us as well. Let's notice what happens when this command is obeyed in Acts chapter 4, 31 through 33. Watch this. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And a multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought, that, that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That's what happens when people are filled with the Spirit of God. The Word of God goes out with power and with boldness. Watch what I got here. When they were filled with the Spirit, they spake not their own words, but they spoke the Word of God with boldness. The Word went out from them in, in the power of the Spirit, and when it did, God blessed their obedience and people were saved. This is the very way the church is to function today. Watch the words of A.W. Tozier on this thought, and I quote, he says, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of the world, much of what we're doing in our churches would go right on and nobody would know the difference. I do not believe in a repetition of Pentecost, but I do believe in a perpetuation of Pentecost. And there is a vast difference between the two, unquote. In other words, what he's saying is this work needs to continue. We, we are filled with the Spirit. And I told you, you got to be careful with Acts. We don't get our theology from here. Because the apostles are going to be gifted individuals with apostolic gifts that we don't have. They're going to speak in tongues. They're going to they're going to they're going to heal people. They're going to do all kinds of miracles that those gifts don't exist anymore today. There's not a need for them. They needed them then. They needed to be able to identify a real apostle from a false apostle. 
because the, the church was relying upon the apostles' doctrine because they didn't have a Bible yet. They didn't have a New Testament. They had the Old Testament, but it was on scrolls. They didn't carry books like you and I do, and so they didn't have the New Testament. So what are you going to follow? They're going to follow the apostles' doctrine. Well, how are you going to know you're going to follow the right guy? You're going to know because God has given the apostles the, the apostolic gifts. And once the Bible's complete and those guys died off, those gifts were gone. There's no longer a need for those gifts. So we're not going to practice those. But we, too, have the Spirit of God that will, that when we're filled with the Spirit and we're controlled by the Spirit and we go out and then it's God, then it's Christ working through me and it's not done in my power, that's when things happen. But back to what Tozier says again, and I'm convinced of this, and I see it, that if the Spirit of God was taken out of a lot of churches or out of, out of the world, a lot of churches would go right on, and they wouldn't even notice that it was gone. There wouldn't be any difference. What's the incentive to walk in obedience? Watch 9 through 11 now. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, or standing there looking at him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Watch this. This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Back to your paper. Here is their incentive and our incentive to carry out the commands of our Lord. Just as Jesus ascended to heaven, he will also return in like manner. For his church, this is a reminder that there's going to be a day of reckoning. That's, what there's, that's, what the, that's part of what this is about. The angel said, just like you've seen him go, he's going to come the same way. In other words, he's coming back. And there's going to be a day of reckoning. You know the verses, Matthew 25. Let me show you this, 14 through 19. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Here's the verse I want you to see. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckon, reckoneth with them. That day is coming. Watch your paper. Our Lord has entrusted us with spiritual gifts. He has went away right here. We read about it. He has empowered us for service. He has given us the grace to exercise our gifts. One day we will stand before him and we will answer for what we did with all of these and more. You understand that? We will give an answer. Now listen, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. We will not, whenever we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, we will not be judged for our sins. They were already judged on the cross 2,000 years ago. So we will not get there and there will not be a judgment for our sins. They were paid for. They were already judged and so that would be double jeopardy. God's not going to do that. But we will be held accountable for how we use what God has entrusted to us. For example, spiritual gifts, opportunities that were put before us. Maybe uh, I could say this, uh, apart from spiritual gifts, talents, uh, abilities to be able to do things, uh, finances, what we do with our finances, how we use them, that those, all of that's from God. All of that's from God. And so we are to use those things to glorify him. But let me go back to the gifts and just uh, take the spiritual gifts. They are the most valuable because in order for us to get them, Christ had to die on the cross. And so with the, with the gifts, God also gives us the grace. Watch Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So you, nobody can say, well, I can't use my gift. I'm just, I, don't, I don't have what it takes. Sure you do. You have the grace to exercise your gift. So someday, someday, 
1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, watch this. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, you shall, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let me give you another reference to it. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore we labor, Paul says, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, let me just say this. The word accepted there, that's not, that doesn't mean you gotta, you gotta, we gotta work and our, and our good works make us accepted. We're accepted in Christ. The idea is here that we would be pleasing to him. That's the idea. Verse 10. For, Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So here's what will happen. Our motives will be tried. And, 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 and what we do is will be uh, uh, one of the things that's going to be looked at is what was our motive? Why did you do? In other words, for me, why did I preach? Did I preach for my own glory or did I preach for God's glory? If I preach for my own glory, that burns up doesn't amount to anything. Watch what he says in verse 11 there. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Let me keep reading. In these verses, Paul reveals his motivation for living in obedience to God's word, and it was the terror of the Lord. But what's he talking about here? Let me see if I can help you with this. This is a reference to a deep reverence for the Lord. It comes, and, and it could be the fear of the Lord, too. It could be translated that way. It comes from the realization that he would one day stand before his creator and answer for what he had entrusted to him. It's a fear in the sense that Paul wanted his service to be pleasing to the Lord. He wanted to hear the words, well done. That's what it is. Paul wanted to make sure that what he did was pleasing to the Lord. He didn't want it to be displeasing. He didn't want it to burn up. He knew it was going to be tried. And I think one of his fears was that whenever he got there, that it wouldn't be pleasing to God. And so with the reverence that he had for God, he wanted to hear those words, well done, Conclusion, watch this. Might we too have a desire to serve in such a way that we will hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We have a limited amount of time given to us for service. Therefore, we need to make the most of every day we live. Let us be very careful about not getting caught up in the world's philosophies. Because I say that because I am very convinced that one of the reasons why believers are not active for God is because they are wrapped up in the world. Somehow, some way, and I, I was thinking about that today, and I thought, you know, just I, sometimes whenever I'm studying, I turn the outdoor channel on, I turn the sound off, and I just let the hunters go about their business. And once in a while, I'll look up and I'll kind of watch those guys and think, well, boy, I'd like to be out there doing that too, but I can't. I got to be here and I got to work. So, but I'll let that on. But I, I just thought of something today, and I thought, how much are we? persuaded and how much are we swayed by what comes through the TV? So many things, so many things that you see. Uh, uh, that's for another time. L let me go back here. I could go on. Let us stay focused upon our Lord and live in the power of the spirit so as to glorify him. Okay. First John two fifteen and 16, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I'm, I'm telling you this. I, I'm just, I want you to listen to me. That you and I got to be so very careful because the wor there is so much lore from the world. And, and what, what happens is you, you, I'll just say it this way. You watch something on TV, maybe you watch one of your... Uh, maybe you're a building show person, you know, uh, 
and you watch the building shows and, if, and, and you come away from there and if you're not careful, here's what happens. You're no longer satisfied with what you got. Have you ever noticed that? It's like you look around and, and before that show come on, well, your house was really nice. And I, you didn't have any problem at all. But after that show goes off, it's like, wow, I'm living in the boondocks here. Uh, this place is a dump. I need to upgrade everything. And so what happens, and it, does, and it happens in a very subtle way, we are basically brainwashed into thinking that you got to, I don't know if I want to say have the best. We have the best whenever we have Jesus in a relationship with him. It doesn't, doesn't get any better than that. But, but it's, it's, it takes away that contentment. It takes that away. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so I say that to say this. We, your, our time is so limited. You got a window. You got a window, okay? And in and, and that, from, from the time of salvation till the time of death, or the time of salvation until the rapture, you got that span right there. And that's the dash on the headstone, by the way. You ever see the dash between the years? That's where you do it, in the dash. Okay? And it's short. And if you get all caught up in the world, you'll find out you get to the end of your life and you'll say, it all got away. It all got away. I got all caught up in that, gave all my energy to things that don't amount to anything. Don't do that. We got to fight against that every single day. Let's pray. Father, Father, thank you for what we read here tonight. First of all, Lord, just the fact that you did not correct your apostles here, these men, when they ask about the kingdom, just solidifies in my mind, which I already knew, but solidifies that there is an earthly kingdom, and those guys look forward to being in that kingdom, and it'll be a kingdom where Israel will be restored to global prominence. And Lord, we look forward to that day, but we're not there. We are in, we are in that gap, so to speak, from the empty tomb to the kingdom. We're in that church age. Lord, as we live here, we look at what you said to your apostles, that they were to be focused on being witnesses for you. And that's what we're to do. Lord, we are to be focused on being your witnesses. And so, Lord, keep us, first of all, forgive us for getting caught up and entangled in the things of the world. There's not a person in this room that's not done it. It's a battle every single day. Lord, keep us from getting entangled. Help us to keep our eyes focused where they need to be upon you. Help us to be reminded that one day, one day, Lord, there will be a day of reckoning when we will give an answer for how we used our spiritual gifts, whatever else it was that you entrusted to us. So take us out of here tonight. Lord, give us safety as we go home. Tomorrow, guide and direct our steps. Lord, help us to be mindful of opportunities that are placed before us. Bring us back on Sunday, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.